uh, you know, uh, we like when uh, all people, God, are together, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, you are not with us, you know, and uh, we think about you. Mm -hmm. and, but we know that uh, something happened with you, that mm -hmm. you are not uh, here. Uh, you know, if uh, people or some brother and sister don't visit, are not uh, here, uh, they have very important reason, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of reason uh, we can turn Bible. Okay. Maybe in this world, yeah. She will with that. Yeah. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe we just start prayer, yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe we ask the brother, uh, you know. Sure. Jehovah, our most high Father in the heavens, we thank you so much that we have the privilege to be able to come to you in prayer right now and to look to you for your guidance and your direction, and your blessing. We uh, are very happy that Phil has met with us this afternoon, and we appreciate his response to, to come and meet with us and to be able to discuss with us your view of this situation, uh, to be able to assure him that he is one of your precious sheep and that uh, we want to assist him spiritually so that he can enjoy your blessing and the contentment that can be found in, in worshiping you and serving you uh, with a pure heart. So bless our discussion and uh, guide us by means of your Holy Spirit. We ask this now through Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh, we can turn uh, for us when the eight. Uh, seven. Can you read for us, Proverbs 28.7 here says... It says 28.13. 13. Yeah. Okay. The one covering over his transgressions will not succeed, but whoever confesses and abandons them will be shown mercy. Yeah. It's a uh, reason why we meet with you, because uh, uh, maybe you have something to uh, tell us or explain okay. about your... Okay. Nothing comes to mind. Well, uh, we should be more more clear. Mm -hmm. that <clears throat> so, w our concern is uh, the uh, is apostasy, which is mm -hmm. the spreading of contrary ideas, mm -hmm. false ideas. teachings. Yeah, which y you know everybody is entitled to in their mm -hmm. to hold their own views. But right. it's when a member of the congregation starts to spread them, then a charge of apostasy comes up. So what Yuri is <laughs> asking is perhaps. Um, if, before we ask, start asking you questions about it, maybe you just have a personal thought you want to share with us mm -hmm. um, on that matter. Not not all the doctrines in there, yeah. you know, just your own heart. Well, <coughs> to put it simply, like first of all, um, apostasy is kind of a tricky word because there's lots of different definitions of apostasy. And like you said, the definition I think is relevant here is spreading false teachings, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that I haven't done anything like that because I haven't been spreading teachings. I don't have teachings to spread. So I don't see how I could be seen as spreading false teachings. You know what I mean? Okay. And basically, what has changed, kind of in my, in my way of viewing things, is um, really what's expressed here in 1 John 4, verse 1. It says, Beloved ones, do not believe every inspired statement, but test the inspired statement, whether they originate with God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. So that's been my approach, because I've always been someone who loves learning. I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to know the truth, whatever it is, right? And it's obviously important to be able to tell truth from, from falsehood. Right. And so, to me, this is a very... Um, interesting, interesting that, it, that it says that here, that should not believe every inspired statement, but test the inspired statements to see whether they originate with God. So it's all about, you know, not taking anything at face value, not taking someone's word for it, but testing everything to see whether we can confirm or disprove any claims that anyone's making. Yeah, I understand, and, and I see what you're getting at. So that leads, so from our perspective, and not far from there, is in um, 3 John. <clears throat> uh, 
sorry, second John. Second John. Second letter. And you'll note verse 9. So Paul, uh, John wrote this letter, of course, to the Christians, and they have their congregations. Mm-hmm. Warning that everyone who pushes ahead and does not remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. Mm-hmm. The one who does remain in the teaching is the one who has both the Father and the Son. But if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them into your homes. Say greeting for him, for that's a share. One is a share in his wicked works. So <clears throat> our perspective, like, you're welcome to explore all mm-hmm. you want. We would not stop you. And I've been we enjoying it. Try. We wouldn't even, mm-hmm. you know, that's up to you. Yeah. What's it at issue is that you're a member of the, our congregation. Mm-hmm and that we feel that you were doing this, um, that you have been... I mean, you're welcome to do it on your own, but when you mm-hmm. share it with others, you start putting doubts into their mind, then that, to us, is the matter that we are concerned. Okay. okay, so you say it's an issue because I'm a member of the congregation. Mm-hmm. So if I wasn't a member of this congregation, it wouldn't be an issue. Oh, well, it would be an issue with any congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, but that's okay. why we are here. Okay, so here. if we say the congregation as in the global, global congregation, if I wasn't part of the organization, then it wouldn't be an issue. No, we wouldn't care. Okay, so if I, hypothetically, if I didn't want to be part of the organization, would this verse apply to me? Uh, do you want to disassociate yourself? No, absolutely not, no. because disassociating, everyone knows, is just the uh, same as disfellowshipping. It's basically voluntarily telling everyone that I want them to shun me, which I absolutely don't want. Of course not. We, we can understand your feeling in that person. Right. Yeah. To me, it's, it's bizarre even, it's, <clears throat> it's even a strange question, because that's what disassociation means. Disassociation means I want an announcement to be made for everyone to start shunning me, mm-hmm. and what sane person would want that? Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I know, but it happens. I mean, and unless, we don't, we unless don't, I thought I was being harassed, right. that would be an entirely different situation, but that's not the case we here. We can't read your mind. It's just the question. Right. Okay, fair enough. Re- relax. We're not suggesting <laughs> that. Um, I just find it a strange question. I know that different people, I mean, circumstances are different, right? Like I said, some people want that, mm-hmm. especially if they feel like they're being harassed, but I certainly haven't. Yeah, yeah I understand. Mm-hmm. So, anyhow, you guys want to ask any questions? Well, I guess to make it clear, so the reason that we've had this meeting this afternoon mm-hmm. is because we do have proof that you have spread apostasy, mm-hmm. and that's not something that we're interested in debating. We know that. We've, we've talked okay. to the witnesses that have heard some of the comments that you've made. So you're not so interested in, sorry, I just want to see if I understand, you're not interested in debating whether or not I've committed apostasy? That's right, because we have proof. No, I, uh, yeah, we're not interested that, that in... That sounds an awful lot like if, like if my guilt had been decided before I got here. No, that's not what we're saying. Okay. The reason that we're meeting with you this afternoon is because we want to encourage you to change the course that you're going down. Because you've already decided that I'm guilty. You've committed a sin that's merited three brothers meeting together with you on a judicial committee. That's why you're here this afternoon. Because if that had been decided ahead of time, then it... Wouldn't it have been more honest to tell me that ahead of time? I mentioned that to you on the phone that there was a we were concerned about you spreading your views. You said that you were concerned. And, yeah, and and you said, as I recall, you said, could the meeting result in me being fellowship? And I said yes. Mm, you and you said that you don't know. I said it could result. I said it, I didn't. I said you said would it automatically? I said I don't know because that's up to the committee. You, you seem to be trying say, very hard not to say that though. Is the thing. Because I can't make that decision in advance, because we didn't. Uh, it depends on your, your own uh, viewpoint and, and the way, way you feel about matters. But what we did make it clear to you, what I made it clear to you on the phone, was that it was a judicial committee case. Because mm-hmm. you asked me. I did. I, 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 That's I, one I did accept the question. I told you, because I wanted to tell you. We have to tell you. You have a right to that. And um, it could go that way or not. And we want you to understand that the purpose of a judicial committee is not to disfellowship you. That's not what we want to do. Mm-hmm. I don't want to do that. Yuri doesn't. Mm-hmm. Sarah doesn't. No we don't want to disfellowship you. Mm-hmm. But we do want to see a change because we feel that you are in spiritual danger mm-hmm. and the congregation is potentially as well from the evidence that we've seen. Mm-hmm. So we want to help you to change your course. And you feel that threatening a fellowshipping is a, is a good way to We're do that? We're not threatening anything. We're not? No. Because if we weren't threatening the fellowshipping, we, couldn't we have exactly this without um, convening a judicial committee? No, because, because because of what you've done, 
because of you're ignoring the council, we've met with you beforehand. I went to your house with Eric. Yuri and I went to your house. Uh-huh. We talked to you about what you were doing. You've uh-huh. had a lot of scriptural counsel, uh-huh. and we've been very clear about what you're doing and how serious it is. That's been made known to you very well. Uh-huh. And that's why the three of us have to meet with you now. With the threat of disfellowship on the table. We would like to put Because isn't that what a judicial committee is? We don't threaten people. We try to help them, and if they don't want help, then it could result in them being put out of the congregation. But if that was the case, then all of that could be accomplished without a judicial committee. No. Why, why would it be... This, we're following the scriptural direction that we meet together with somebody to try to help them, and um, you want to be helped. Mm-hmm. Would, would you be receptive to us sharing some scriptural thoughts with you to show you that Jehovah still views you as a member of the congregation? Well, I would like you to stay that way. If you can help in line with what I mentioned earlier from First John four one in providing me evidence that that I've you know come to some wrong conclusions, then I'm opening to hearing that evidence. About First John four one, you know, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He was in the earth, and He died for us. You believe that? I know that the Bible says that. Yeah, but you know the uh, verse three continue and mm-hmm. explain more about this first verse. Mm-hmm. It means uh, it's like open more mind mm-hmm. or think uh, uh, verse second and three. Mm-hmm. Did you see? Yeah, this is how you know that the inspired statement is from God. Every inspired statement that acknowledges Jesus Christ as having come in the flesh originates with God but every inspired statement that does not acknowledge Jesus does not originate with God. Furthermore, this is the Antichrist's inspired statement that you have heard was coming, and now it is already in the world. So, what it's saying here, like, well, maybe you can tell me what you think this means, because it, what it seems to say here is every statement, every inspired statement that acknowledges Jesus comes from God. Wouldn't that include things like the Quran, the Book of Mormon? It seems like a very broad definition here. Yeah. I don't know if you can maybe clarify that for me. Yeah, you know, it's just what means about the first uh, verse, you know. It's like, uh, uh, it means about some people who don't believe in Jesus Christ, you know, and share this uh, uh, news, you know. Mm-hmm. Because you, in the beginning, you... Like this verse, you know? mm-hmm. No, and I, I am familiar with the the context of the of this epistle. Um, I know at at the time and there I, were. I won't understand you. You believe uh, if compare this uh, verse first. You believe uh, what believe Jehovah's Witnesses or not? I believe that our beliefs should be based on evidence, and that those beliefs are subject to change depending on what the evidence shows, mm-hmm. and that applies to all beliefs, religious or political or of any kind, scientific, all beliefs should be subject to evidence. That's what I believe. But you, I can understand, he, he believe or not, uh, what believe Jehovah's Witness or not, the teaching group. You believe in teaching uh, Jeho- uh, what believe Jehovah's uh, Witness. I believe that all of our beliefs should be subject to evidence and should be subject to being proved or disproved dep- depending on the evidence. My beliefs are flexible because they are dependent this is a good time to go to First Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter two. Chapter two. Second <coughs> uh, Timothy, chapter two. So we read in verse, um, verses twenty-three, twenty-six again. It says, further, reject foolish and ignorant debates, knowing that they produce fights. For a slave of the Lord does not need a fight, but needs to be gentle toward all, qualified to teach, showing restraint when wronged, instructing with mildness those not favorably disposed. Perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to an accurate knowledge of truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. So that's kind of the, the point of a committee like this. 
when we meet with some who may have committed a serious uh, scriptural wrong, is to to bring them back, to lead them to repentance. Mm-hmm. Not to debate. You, you can have. You can endlessly debate. There will be no end to debate in the mm-hmm. world over. Well, this came up. That came up. This came up. We trust that. From our, our, what we've come to see with our own eyes and learn, we trust this organization. Um, it's not infallible. It makes mm-hmm. mistakes. Of course it does. Mm-hmm. Know, right? Yeah. Uh, the apostles make mistakes. But the thing is, we trust that this is the, the, what Jehovah God is using mm-hmm. as his, uh, his earthly mechanic, the mechanics on the earth as far as teaching people the truth. So our hope is that we can bring you back to that. Mm-hmm. That's all. Okay. By what means? Scripturally. Is what there... do you appreciate? See, we have, we um, will show you that first of all that um, Jehovah still cares about you. Mm-hmm. I don't think you doubt that, anyways. But that uh, we'd like you back. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, scripturally, the congregation doesn't. Um, um, how can I put this right? It doesn't. Uh, it's not a place for open debate with different ideas from all of different religions and philosophy and science and the whole bit. Mm-hmm. Because we get our food, spiritual food, from the from God's organization, mm-hmm. and it uh, it stands up pretty well. Yeah, and I'm kind of I'm kind of glad you said that because that's kind of why I stopped coming because this isn't a place for open discussion. This is a place where information comes from the top down, and obedience means belief. And like I said, my firm belief is that beliefs should be based on evidence Mm -hmm. and that discussion should not be restricted and that if evidence contradicts your belief, the only logical course is to change your beliefs. Fair enough. Yeah. And you're welcome to do that. Mm -hmm. The thing is, um, as you can see, we don't have to, I don't think we have to explain this at at length to you, that um, in the congregation... um, if that's your, the way you want, scripturally and historically, that is not tolerated in the congregation. Can you show me that? We just did. So if someone comes to you and has a different, a different belief, right? You're talking about um, Second John again, right? Yeah. Because um, the the historical context around that verse um, is is really relevant here. At the time. There were there were certain um, there were various different Christian churches at the time, right? Mm-hmm. And there were some groups who taught things like there was an idea called Docetism, mm. which was they taught that Jesus was divine and therefore not fully human; that he was um, basically that he only appeared to be human. He was like a divine being who came in the appearance of a human, but was not actually human, mm-hmm. and. This was not the majority of view at the time. This was con- later condemned as a uh, heresy. Mm-hmm. And, there was, and there was that, and there was another idea. Um, I don't know if it was quite as popular among the people he was, he was writing to, but there were other people who believed that Jesus had been sort of adopted as God's son, that he was not a pre-existent uh, spiritual creature, but that he was a person, a prophet, and that he, it was called an adoptionist uh, mm-hmm. idea, that he at some point, either at the point of his resurrection or earlier, became God's son, so to speak. And so when he says, uh, where was the verse again? It, it, like, if you look at the, a few verses back for the context, verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those not acknowledging Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Mm-hmm. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. So, knowing what we know about the time that he was writing in, it seems very clear that that's, he was specifically talking about that, about people who called themselves Christians, but did not acknowledge Jesus Christ coming in the flesh specifically. Right. And then he says, not to, um, if someone comes to you not bringing this teaching of Jesus coming in the flesh, not to, allow, not to receive them into your homes. Mm-hmm. And of course, also important to recognize that receiving people into their homes, <coughs> that was their meetings at the time. <coughs> right. They didn't have church buildings in right. the first century. Yeah. All meetings of any kind were groups of Christians group getting together at someone's home. Right. So he was basically telling them um, 
someone comes to you bringing this teaching, this, you know, you're not considered this to be a Christian teaching. Don't receive him into your homes as, as teaching at a meeting. Right. That's, that's how I read this, at least. Well, we're, we, uh, we're on the same page in that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see what the... the so, like, if I, were, if I were to come to the, to the hall and want to give a talk mm-hmm. on, on, you know, something that I found interesting, mm-hmm. um, then according to this, if, if I were either talking about these, these other um, ideas that the author of this writer was contrary to or anything else that's contrary to doctrine, well, then you wouldn't receive me as a, as a member of the congregation teaching the congregation. Okay. That's entirely different from saying no one talk to this person even if you're immediate family. Well, you, perhaps you missed this line here where it says, or say a greeting to him. Saying a greeting to that's him, especially... That's being on the platform and he's teaching, you know, hi. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that's being a friend. That's being a association, so to speak, associating. Mm-hmm. So that adds a, that extra element to that right there. Mm-hmm. So would this, the way you read this, would this mean not to say a greeting to anyone who doesn't believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh? Pardon me? When you say that this, you know, you pointed out the verse, the, the, the line that says, do not say a greeting to him. To whom would that apply? Would that apply to anyone who does not believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? That depends on the circumstances. It depends whether they're already a member of the congregation or not, for one thing. Is that what but it says you're, here? You're, pardon me? Is that what it says here? That's a guide. That it says that it, it's only for people who are a member of the congregation? Well, you know your Bible pretty well, so you must know that we can take this uh, one thing and try to say that, well, it doesn't exactly say this or that, but we know when we look at different parts of the Bible, especially the Christian Greek scriptures, that greeting, the context usually means someone who is called a brother, normally. I've never heard that. Well, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, under the heading, under the subject of putting people out of the congregation and the different wrongs that they do. I mean, you can read the whole paragraph if you wish. It talks about it. It doesn't cover every single wrong thing we can do. Mm-hmm. But it just says, well, uh, verse 13, remove the wicked person from among yourselves. So it's not talking about the guy that comes off, of, off the street from the public and says, I have something to show you from the Quran. Mm-hmm. Whatever, whatever example you want, we'd like to use. Mm-hmm. Remove the wicked person from among yourselves. Well, if it's from among ourselves, is obviously the congregation. Remind me which verse that is. Verse thirteen. Thirteen. And anyways, verse eleven, writing you to stop keeping company with anyone called a brother. And then he uses a variety of different. Uh, I'm in the wrong chapter. It must be in the oh, wrong chapter. Verse thirteen. Oh, five. I'm sorry. Chapter five. Sorry. Okay. I'm looking at chapter 6. That's better. (laughs) So, there you go. It's it's there for you to take take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Which one was it? Uh, Verse 11 uh, and verse 13 are probably the most relevant. Mm -hmm. To stop keeping company. It's a bit vague, isn't it? With anyone called a brother. But to stop keeping company. Uh, in verse 13, remove the wicked person from among yourselves. Yeah, put nice. Mm-hmm. So That's not vague. It can be. No, it's not. Does stop associating mean stop talking altogether? And as we've already mentioned, so we're not here to debate. We don't want to argue, mm-hmm. but we want to help you to repentance. So we're not, we don't want to pick apart all these little scriptures and, and the scriptures are not for our interpretation. We, we're here to talk about your conduct and how we can help you to repair your relationship with Jehovah. Mm-hmm. So we don't, we don't want to get in that trap of debating over each individual verse. Well, what I'm, what I'm getting at is, like I said, my beliefs and my actions are based on evidence. At least that's what I try to do. So, again, I might be misunderstanding you, but if... If you're here to bring me back, as you say, but using something other than evidence, then 
I don't see how that can really be compelling. What do you have other than evidence that, that should convince me to believe or, or act differently? Philip, for example, if you work in company, yeah? mm -hmm. and your boss tells that you have to do work in this way, yeah? Mm -hmm. If you do another way, mm -hmm. what you, the boss in uh, the result, what you do? Uh -huh. He tells, you know, you, can work, you cannot, like, uh, work with me or stay here because mm -hmm. you use it another way, but I am going that you have to be used this way, you know? And you know... Mm -hmm. Well, I don't work for you, though. All of us, you know, <laughs> all of us, Jehovah, we, have, the yes, we have a very important, we have a, a family father, yeah, in the organization, Jehovah, but, you know? We have direction or a principle in Bible, you know? If somebody don't leave a unit with this, principal, you know, and it's like uh, these uh, people don't uh, listen, uh, they always how we have it, what did you go about, you know? One principal that, for example, that uh, have to be together with brother and sister, you know? Hebrews chapter 10, 24, 25, yeah? Mm -hmm. What Jehovah say, you know, and Jesus Christ. But, oh. you know, we we see, we won't help you, mm -hmm. But you, uh, if I can give another example of what I mean, um, like I think, like, like you, you, you mentioned, in, you, you commented in passing that I know my Bible well. I learned um, that I don't know my Bible nearly as well as I thought I did, mm -hmm. even now, um, because I've been, you know, I've been learning a lot of things last year and studying a lot of interesting things, and I've been studying a lot about the history of the Bible and about early Christianity. And I was shocked to find just how little I did know about it. Mm -hmm. Like, even, even the most basic things, like who wrote the uh, Epistle to the Hebrews? The Epistle to the Hebrews was written anonymously. It never says anywhere who wrote it. Different scholars have, suggest have made different suggestions. The one thing that everyone's really quite certain about is that it wasn't Paul, because it doesn't match his style of writing in any way, um, but nobody's quite sure who wrote it. And that was something that I had that I was completely unaware of. Just to give one example, okay. the what, the, the amount of information that that, that I've <coughs> that I've been able to, um, to to find on it has just been it's just been amazing, and I've been absolutely loving learning about it. You know, good for you, mm -hmm. um, and you're you're welcome to that. It's just at, the at issue is not what you've done in your own private personal study. Mm -hmm. At issue is that you've tried to convince others to do so. Like for example. Why did you even show up to the regional convention last summer? Because yeah. I missed my friends and wanted to say hi. I thought I was quite clear about that. Okay. Um, but what did you talk to them about? It depended on the person, what they asked me about. Most, if, if they wanted to talk about the weather, that's what I talked about. I was there just to, just to be pleasant. Just for and and if, if some people asked me questions regarding why I'm not attending meetings, I would answer those questions and then remind them, I didn't come here to talk about that. And if you ask them, that, I'm sure they'll, they'll remember me saying that. I was quite, I reminded people about that because that's not why I was there. You were going to say something? No, just that... Because uh, um, he was also asking me. Yeah, I And he was asking, he was pushing, like I was, if you ask him, I'm sure he'll tell you that I was perfectly content to keep the conversation very casual and, you know, not talk about anything controversial, but he kept asking and I, Answered them honestly. For example, the brother, mm -hmm. you know, and when you when he uh, asked you how are you and uh, mm -hmm. uh, everything okay, and uh, you answered that everything okay, and uh, you don't believe uh, the teacher could believe the whole sentence, you know. Mm -hmm. But he asked you why you here, and you answered that you have here uh, friends, you know, why you mm -hmm. here, you know. Yeah, and the only reason that came up is because he was asking me what congregation I was going to, and I told him that I wasn't attending a congregation, and then he kept, you know, asking more questions, and I answered mm -hmm. the, the additional questions that he was asking. Mm -hmm. I didn't go there to convert him or anyone else. Yeah, but you know, all these people, mm -hmm. they uh, don't think that you are friend, they are friend. Why not? You know, have I done anything to hurt them? Because they have shock when you, they 
through you and uh, your speech, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of them uh, think because they don't understand that uh, you are in the wrong way, but uh, some of them, for example, uh, he mm -hmm. thinks that you are in danger way, danger way and your mind and uh, the another brother and sister, you know. Okay. Was I trying to preach to any of them with any contrary false teachings? Well, are you saying did they try it? I, I'm saying, what, do you, did any of them, like, well, I'm just asking you, in your view, was I going there and trying to teach them any false teachings? Was I, tr was I trying to convince them that I, that I was right? Do you think that's why I was there? Well, we can't read your mind. No? Maybe you... I'm asking you what you think, though. And that, that, uh, just based on what uh, I've, we've heard, what we were told by and he's talked to some of them there, is that... Uh, Although you say, you ask, they ask how you're doing, what kind of you're going, um, certainly you know what effect it has on, what effect it would have to start telling them that um, I don't believe in this, but now, maybe I believe in this now. Um, did you, or even what you did with, with Hebrews, maybe you did that with other things too. That well, yeah, you know, what, what the organization is teaching is one thing, but I've learned this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What do you expect uh, that to be? What do you see that as? You've been you were in there. Mm -hmm. You're probably you've been baptized a long time. Right? You know what the answer is, right? I <clears throat> I expect open discussion. You were in the truth that long, and you expect that some will sit there and debate whether well, I no. wrote this book or whether this date is right or wrong according to your organization. You, you you've been in this that long. With, you don't know. For that, I I expect them to get uncomfortable and change the subject. Mm -hmm. I only talked about it when they asked, and if. And I kept reminding them that that's not what I came here to talk about because I knew that some of them wouldn't want to talk about that yeah. and because I didn't, wasn't there to bring that up. So did somebody ask you, do you still believe in Jehovah's Witnesses as an organization? I'm sure some did. Because you're saying that that's not what you came to ask, talk about, but I can't imagine anybody, I, we haven't seen anybody saying that they actually went up to you and said, ja uh, sorry, Phil, <laughs> Phil, do you still believe that so and so wrote this book of the Bible, or that this date is right, or that maybe is it possible that evolution could be right, or like anything like that. I, I, anybody actually ask you that specifically? They didn't start the conversation that way. Of course not. So why would it come up? That's the point. It yeah. came. It, well, it probably came up because I was wearing a beard and hadn't been to meetings in a while. You mean someone <laughs> said you, you're wearing a beard? So do you believe that uh, this prophet is wrong? He didn't write this book. The date is wrong, and so forth. No, I'm saying people will ask me, why did you stop attending meetings? Okay. That seems like a, that's a question that people have asked me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, and given that I'm not attending meetings, people will ask me, do you still believe that, that this religion is the truth? Right? Did they actually ask you that? Probably. I don't remember the exact words. Yeah. For example, yeah. you... Uh, answer that uh, you don't believe that you consider the book Daniel that is uh, Jehovah's Witnesses don't explain uh, about uh, they were wrong about date you know mm -hmm. like this it won't remi remember this history you know mm -hmm. uh, you know and it means that you consider and you believe another teaching you know about date that this book is wrong uh, right and is uh, mm -hmm. wrong you know uh, or uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, explain it, explain wrong, uh, you know, is not uh, that date. Mm -hmm. You have something about it? I remember having that conversation. Yeah. And with mm -hmm. others. And I specifically remember reminding them, I did not come here to talk about this. Mm -hmm. I specifically told them, I'm only, you know, I'm only saying this because you asked me this question. They said, yes, yes, and then they would ask me follow-up questions about it. So can I ask you a question? We know you're a pretty smart guy. Thank uh, you. I try. And obviously, because you haven't been to the meetings in quite a while, you knew when you came to that convention that people would ask, where have you been, what have you been up to? Mm -hmm. What did you think about in advance before you went to the convention? Did you think about a response that you would give to them? I thought about, well, basically what I, what I told you would be, um, my intention to not bring up any controversial subjects unless someone specifically asks me first, but that if anybody asked me any specific questions, that I would answer them honestly. And then 
remind them that that's not what I came here to talk about and attempt to keep everything very casual and friendly and completely um, not, uh, not controversial in, in any way. So did you have in mind a plan because you have beliefs that differ from what the organization believes? Mm -hmm. Did you have in mind how you would avoid mentioning those or bringing those up even if they did start to pry a little bit? I, I wasn't planning on dodging the questions, if that's what you mean. Okay. Did you think about that before you went, that that would be something that could become controversial and people might ask about your beliefs and how that could even lead to the spread of apostasy? Was that on your mind before you went to the convention? That's specifically why I kept reminding people that that's not why I was there. But would you say you were determined not to bring up any of those posts? For those personal beliefs? I didn't bring up any of them. Okay. Great. Nevertheless, you shared it with them. Should I have lied? Well, when we have an, not even just religious beliefs, anything that's kind of... Sometimes we hold back, and we hold back what we know, knowledge we have, because we either, for whatever reason, maybe someone's not entitled to that information, or maybe we don't want to hurt their feelings, there's different scenarios in life where we don't say something. I definitely didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. That's that. why I kept reminding them that that's not why I came here, and I kept trying to steer the conversation towards never more casual situations. Nevertheless, we have in a number of instances, at, even just at that alone, that place alone, where it, you were quite specific. You know, you could have said, we don't have to talk about that now. I mean, if you really didn't want to bring it up, or if you didn't want to be controversial, you could have done that. Well, I wasn't, I'm not ashamed of any of the information that I found. You don't have to be, but you don't have to share it either. You didn't have to. That's that's the. I, I don't think you're seeing that. But nobody forced you. Phil, tell us now. You know. His, well, you know, what I'm saying is, when a friend of mine asks me a question, I didn't see any good reason why I should conceal the things that I learned. One important reason, you know, because uh, these brother and sister, this problem, this time, one day, why why they told for us, you mm -hmm. know, us, uh, and they explain because. Uh, they disturb your uh, situation, you know, what situation you are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, our work, like elders, it's we that we protect congregation, you know, and uh, we try to, but first we try to help, you know. Mm -hmm. But if some people are not going to take help, you know, it's like uh, elders like, uh, try to help you to back and uh, to change your mind, uh, because your mind is uh, a wrong way. You understand it? In what way? No way. Like I said, my, my, way, way, my way is wanting to way, base my beliefs way, on evidence. Way, is that wrong? Way to apostasy. Is wanting to base my beliefs on apostasy wrong? Uh, base my beliefs on evidence wrong? Well, I don't know. That's a loose term anyway, is evidence. Evidence changes. It really decade, doesn't. Every decade, every, every hundred years. Evidence, a couple hundred years ago, what where we were in, in space or in the universe. They call it evidence. You know the evidence changes. And, and that's, that's not, not what evidence is. The issue that we're looking at is not our personal belief. Um, uh, in general, all of us may have different opinions about certain matters. And in many situations, that's perfectly fine. Jehovah gave us free will. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to our understanding of the Bible, scriptural teaching, Jehovah trains us by means of his visible organization. He uses the governing body, faithful and discreet slaves. We all made a dedication to Jehovah, and we said that we would be obedient to the faithful and discreet slaves. We would accept their teachings. Remember what Peter said to Jesus, who would we go away to? Mm -hmm. We've all made that decision to obey what the faithful and discreet slaves teaches us from God's word, the Bible. That's the issue that's being discussed right now. Well, when, when Peter said to Jesus, who would we go away to, was he talking about leaving an organization or following an individual? Well, we'd have to interview Peter to know the exact words. It's just a general point. Where else would we go? What was his point? He was talking about Jesus. You. Yeah. He was I, talking about Jesus. Yeah, where else are we followers of Christ? We're Christians. That's the Christian congregation. He's there are the congregation. well over a billion Christians in the world who all claim to follow Christ. So... It, now is it an issue of whether this is the true organization? Like, what's your point? My point is that Peter's words to Jesus don't <coughs> support remaining in one specific church. Yeah. 
it means that it is not important to visit organization, yeah, or to be an organization, or to be an organization, yeah. What, I, what I'm saying is that what Peter said had nothing to do with any organization. <coughs> so do you believe that Jesus is the head of the congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses? I believe that any opinion on that should be based entirely on the evidence. I don't know. Based on I don't know opinion, what. Do you believe that? I don't know what God or Jesus think about any specific organization. If anybody wants to make any claims about that, I would want to see some evidence. You haven't seen that evidence in the years you've been baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. If you have any evidence, I would consider it. Hmm. But that's not what we're here for, is it? Hmm. But uh, what do you think? Uh, what, uh, how do you feel Jehovah? He wants that you have to be like this in this situation, or you have to be in congregation? Well, <coughs> um, to quote, I'm trying to remember who said this originally, but there's a, a very famous quote that I heard was that I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, would intend for us to forgo their use. If God in endowed me with sense and re reason and logic, then that God would want me to use them and to build my beliefs off of those. So it's every man for himself. And so what you can believe what you want. He can believe something different from you. Mm -hmm. I can believe something different from both of you. What do you think those beliefs should be based on, though? On the Bible. You and know, what is that belief Philip, based on? Philip, you know what is different between, between you and us? Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 23 and to 25. What is different, you know? Mm -hmm. Because we have the same between, we have the same mind, mm -hmm. and uh, the same uh, bit, you know? But look, what is, uh, the, what is different between you and the uh, third or congregation and all organizations in Jehovah's Witnesses? 22 to 25. 23 mm -hmm. to 25. Mm -hmm. Can you read first? 20, 10, 22 to 25? 10, 23, 23. to 25. Let us hold firmly the public declaration of our hope without wavering, for the one who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another so as to incite to love and fine works, not forsaking our meeting together, as some have the custom, but encouraging one another, and all the more so as you see the day drawing near. You believe in this, and you did this? You do this? I believe, right. m what, I've, what I've been talking about, this is quite different from what I was talking about. What I'm talking about is what our beliefs should be based on. But you do this uh, in your life? Uh, you, like, try to... Encourage my friends? Sure. No, no, no. no, no <laughs> but uh, explain, like, uh, when you try to use it in your life, to visit congregation, uh, and... Uh, to be together with uh, Jehovah's people. Again, this isn't talking about a specific organization or a specific church. You're trying but to take these know, verses and to people, apply them to you know, the Watchtower Corporation specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but that's you know, not how I read it. You know, it would over, uh, here we see that uh, 25, that uh, 24, uh, and 25, that we have to be meet together, you know, mm -hmm. it uh, meets about so many people, you know, but Jehovah is uh, like a uh, God uh, who is uh, a God organization. For example, uh, the Bible wrote that uh, uh, overseas have to be like uh, organized, yeah? We, we find the word in the Bible about uh, people who have to be like organized, you know, mm -hmm. and Jehovah God is like uh, organizing, he organized his organization using mm -hmm. the uh, government body, mm -hmm. using that uh, uh, slave, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Faith, right? Because Jesus for it thought about it that he have to be give food for us, you know. You believe in that? About spiritual food that he give for us. Do I believe that Jesus gives us spiritual food? Yeah, through the faithful slave. Right? I think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, it comes down to, again, uh, it's just, do you believe that 
uh, spiritual food, true spiritual food, is being dispensed through this organization? I would believe it if I had evidence for it. If you have evidence for it, I would consider it. But you, are we here to debate that or not? It, it seems to be, <coughs> I seem to be getting confused on that. <coughs> Could you please go with me to First Corinthians 1 and verse 10? Mm-hmm. So, you know what, you read it. Go ahead, Phil. First Corinthians 1 and 10. Now I urge you, brothers, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you should all speak in agreement, and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you may be completely united in the same mind and in the same line of thought. Thank you. So is the Christian congregation an open forum for open debate? Are you suggesting that this here says that you should avoid talking about anything that other people disagree with? What do you say? That's not how I read it at all. How do you interpret it then? Well, he says that, that you should be um, basically to be working together and not working against each other. There should be no divisions among you. You should not be fighting each other, right? You should stay, stay together and basically not, basically speaking against any kind of, any infighting that could uh, have occurred within this congregation. So, yeah. in that case, so, are you suggesting this doesn't apply in this case, that we are, you're our brother, Christian brother, mm -hmm. you were baptized, and at the moment, we are united and speaking in agreement and have no division. Because that's what he's saying not to do. So, are you saying this doesn't apply to us, to this room? Well, well I would say I didn't call this meeting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's not what's at issue. What's at issue is you said you don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you, well, in that case, does it or does it not apply? Are we in agreement? Well, are, we, are we united? Are, are we, do we have, div or do we Well, have we're not, meeting? right now we're not part of the same congregation. Same mind and in the same line of thought? In the sense that I haven't been exactly. attending, I haven't attended meetings in, what, eight months now? You're still a member of our congregation. And if I wasn't, w or let's put it this way, would I be able to leave freely with no consequences? What Am I free to leave with no consequences, what with are dignity? Consequences, consequences like re requiring all my friends and family to shun me. Yeah, that is sad Most sad. organizations would consider that rather severe consequences. Yeah, it is. But apparently, though, it hasn't deterred you from, from what we've been talking about. Are you saying it should have? Well, that's up, it depends on what you want. That's not to me. I guess what I'm, what I'm questioning is whether punishing people for leaving the congregation, whether there's any possible defense for that, whether there's any justification for that. Well, you know, it, it's, a bi it's a Bible pattern. It's a um, it's direction from the scriptures. Do the scriptures... You know, we, we're not the, the ultimate authority on that. We're following the direction from the scriptures. That's all. Would you like to make the changes that you need to make so that you can be a part of the congregation and not be shunned by your family because the organization does have rules. Jehovah is a sovereign God. He has things that he expects of us when we dedicate our lives to him. Would those rules prevent me from engaging in open discussion and, and things about, um, about things I'm learning? They would prevent us from speaking against the teachings that are presented in the organization. They would, they would be against uh, speaking against the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society specifically? The faithful and discreet slaves. Watchtower is a legal name. It's an entity so that we can print and that sort of thing. Right, but for, but, what teaches us. but for how long the governing body was exactly the same as the board of directors of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Yeah, and as we learned that it was better to, to separate the legal entity from the spiritual head, or the, from the spiritual uh, source of food. Mm -hmm. production. It was, it was, we learned, and so we adjusted. Mm -hmm. as, you, as you've seen, our organization has adjusted many times. Mm -hmm. But like... So back to that original question, are, are you willing to adhere to the teachings of the governing body? I'm not willing to, to forego evidence in deciding what I believe. I'm not willing to place the word of the watchtower over the evidence that's presented to me. 
I don't know if you guys think I should do different. Did you guys think that the word of the Watchtower is more important than the evidence that you see? It's, we're not deciding that for you. That's up to you. I'm just wondering if, if, that's, if that's how you see things. Uh, I have a question. Are you with us or are you against us? <laughs> What kind of question is that? One or two, you know, second answer, because you cannot to be of the middle, you know, because Jesus, uh, for I told that, who is not with you, you know, like, uh, you are against me, you know? So everyone you who isn't... Or you with us or you against us? So are you saying everyone who is, with, who is not with Jehovah's Witnesses is against Jesus? Is that what you're saying? No, I uh, ask you, you know. This question was for you, you know? Well, I'm with you as individuals because I still consider you all my friends. I want all the best for you. I don't want any harm to come to any of you. You know, I can see that your mind is uh, with us. In what way? Is it because my beliefs your are based heart, on evidence? Your heart is not with us. What, what do you mean? Your ex. Hmm? Your uh, ex, you know? What you do is uh, not uh, show that you are with us. In what way? Have I done anything against you? Have I done anything against you or you? Nothing personal. Well, it sounds personal. <laughs> it's not. We're just following the scriptural direction, Phil. And you know what it is because you you've been around long enough. You know what it is. Whether you agree with it or not, it's another story. But the point is, this is our scriptural direction, and we're going to follow it. Mm -hmm. we, we were hoping you would, too. You know, that is your decision. Our perspective is the congregation. You're, first of all, well, of course, your well-being, spiritually, if you would respond to our visit with you in, in a positive way, in this way. And, but also the uh, protect, spiritual protection of the congregation. Um, you're worried about being shunned, but being shunned, I mean, no one wants that. I don't want that, right? On the other hand, what that will do is it protects others in the congregation from hearing viewpoints that are contrary to what they've been learning mm -hmm. from you. That's what that would accomplish, partly what would accomplish. Mm -hmm. So we're not telling you something you don't know. You couldn't have forgotten all these things that you've learned. This is from the perspective of, of our congregation. We're not telling the world how to live, you know. But you baptize, you're baptized, you're a member of the congregation. That's what, mm -hmm. why you are here. Do you understand that? We, other, if, if the other billion Christians want to claim they're Christian and they've got evidence for this or that, that's their business. Mm -hmm. Because they're not part of the <coughs> congregation, the worldwide congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. For the present, you are. And you have been for a long time. So that's why we are here. Well, you keep saying that you're following scriptural direction, but where do the scriptures describe having a secret meeting to decide whether or not somebody should be shunned by their friends and family? You know what I mean? Is that scriptural direction or is that watchtower direction? The, the scriptures don't give us every single detail because we're not stupid. Right? But, yeah, but suppose the scriptures were to suggest something other than the Watchtower um, code of conduct that, you're, that you have to follow and the, the, the directions and the shepherd, of, shepherd the flock of God manual. Suppose the Bible were to indicate something that deviates from the specific rules set out in specific Watchtower documents. Is it more important to follow scriptural direction or to follow Watchtower direction? The question is relevant. Irrelevant. Yeah, it is. Irrelevant. Yep. You know, I'll tell reason. you why. You see, you Go ahead. it's irrelevant because we already, with our eyes, you look, uh, where do you begin? Point is, we already have faith in the the, uh, the tool that Jehovah is using, that Jesus is using to direct the congregation. We've seen good results worldwide, the kind of people it produces. It, it, there's no end to, the evidence isn't based strictly on wording of a scripture that you can pick apart and debate it for, for hours. Or that some historian, he saw something a little different, so maybe the watchtower is wrong. That's not what it's about, Phil. You should know that. You've been around a long time. You've, why do you care about the people in the, in the organization? They're good people. Why are mm -hmm. they like that? Because they're benefiting 
from spiritual direction through God's organization. It's not a, a coincidence that 8 billion, million people worldwide are united in their, but not just the way they think, but the way they feel about yeah, their heart. You said something quite similar to something I remember saying. You seem to think that people in the congregation are good people because they're in the congregation. They change. I can say that from personal experience. Well, people change by all means. Yeah, that's but you don't think people you don't think people could be good people outside of the congregation. Yes, they no doubt. But I'm talking about people. The effect that we have seen on people who couldn't make the changes, and then they changed when they were contacted, they were studying. You know the whole. Thing. Do you imagine? Do you suppose that other religions have have the same experiences? It doesn't matter to me, because I see it. We see it here locally and worldwide among 8 million people. That is not random coincidence. It doesn't matter to you that the same pattern might occur in a wide variety of other religions? And if that happens in other religions, our hope is that those people, if they have the right, since they may have the right heart condition, we can't judge them, but maybe they do, if that's it, they will be drawn to God's organization. It almost sounds like if it doesn't matter to you whether the evidence supports your beliefs or not. We already have our evidence. We don't need to be convinced of anything. We know the truth and we believe it. We've seen the evidence. And it takes humility as well, because when Jesus was on the earth, what did he say? The wisest, next to Jehovah, the wisest being in the universe. And he said, I can't speak anything of my own initiative. That was Jesus, next to Jehovah. Humility is knowing that I know nothing. Humility and, and wisdom is being aware of my own ignorance. If I sit here and say, I know, I know, and I know, and I don't need any evidence, that's the exact opposite of humility. Humility is saying, I don't know. I don't know. If somebody's presenting with evidence, I'll consider the evidence because I know that I don't know ahead of time what the outcome is going to be. And so at what point did it become necessary to deviate from Jehovah's organization and look for evidence outside of it? It became, when did it become necessary to look for evidence outside of it? Yes. Yeah. In a way, that's always been that's always been necessary, because if without that, then if I had been born a Mormon, if I had been born a Catholic, and I didn't look for evidence outside of that, that's what I'd be following, because I'd be raised to, to trust that organization. I cannot base my trust based on what organization I was born into or what organization seems good to me so far. But what you didn't always look outside the organization. Well, I've always looked, like, in, in terms of looking for evidence, I've always been interested. And the, and the Watchtowers are always quoting outside information, too, quoting different historians, quoting different scientific uh, sources. I started researching more into, into certain other sources because the Watchtower was quoting certain other sources and using them as references. So I was like, I want to learn more about this. I'll go where they're going. But you are baptized. And uh, when you baptize, you believe that here is uh, uh, like uh, the Jewish witnesses, right? Yeah, and their teachers in the Bible. Yeah, you believe in that? I, I was 16 at the time, and yes, that was what I believed. You believe, but uh, who changed your mind now? Who who changed my mind? Yeah. I changed my mind. Uh, who helped you? What you do? What you do that uh, you uh, change your mind? But something, mm -hmm. for example, for me, change by uh, Bible, you know. For him to you know, but for you, what book changed your, or maybe computer, internet? I don't know what changed your mind. Studying the Bible changed my mind. Yeah. Because yeah, studying the Bible, I realized that there were more and more things that I was learning that were new that weren't coming from the Watchtower. And when I would look in the Watchtower to find explanations about these fantastic things that I was learning, I'd find either simplistic explanations that didn't explain anything at all, or sometimes just complete silence. If I can give you another example that's kind of somewhat trivial, a, r a relatively trivial example of what I'm talking about in terms of looking at, at outside sources. Um, consider when we read about David and Goliath. How tall was Goliath? Like I said, it's a trivial, it's yeah. a trivial example. This book here will tell us that Goliath was what was it, six cubits in a span, which is about nine foot something. That's what it says in, in this Bible. Um, I learned from, from research that I did that different manuscripts have different numbers and that the very oldest manuscripts don't say
say six cubits in a span, but the very oldest manuscripts say four cubits in a span, mm-hmm. which is about six foot seven. Or was it six nine? I can't remember exactly. Yeah, it's, it is trivial. But the point is, I found this interesting at the time. Uh-huh. And there, there were some interesting lines of evidence that seemed to suggest that the original reading might have been four cubits in a span. It's hard to say for sure because we, of course, don't have the original documents. Nevertheless, it was interesting and it was new. And when I looked for information from the Watchtower about that, there was no even hint that any other manuscripts had it any other way. There was, it, it simply was not... Um, it was like either the writing department doesn't even know about it or they just, they just don't want to talk about it. So that was just an example of why looking at, at, at other sources gives me more complete, more interesting information. Uh, you know, I just want to about uh, answer because uh, in the beginning you talk about Watchtower, yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh, why I have to use Watchtower, yeah? If mm-hmm. I understand you right. But you know, uh, because Bible, you told that Bible don't say nothing about Watchtower, yeah? Mm-hmm. But you know, if you read uh, the Matthew 24, mm-hmm. uh, 45, and you know the Jesus for who really is the faithful and discreet slave, mm-hmm. whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't find there that which, what kind of food will be. Bible or Watchtower, no, but it's food. Food, it means that it will be mm-hmm. different food, you know. And uh, you know, it's, uh, this was continue happy that slave in his master and come and find him doing so. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, for us, it's, we feel that this is what is from the script slave, you know, and from mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Watchtower, Wake, and Bible, you know. Mm-hmm. Because Watchtower and Wake take uh, on the Bible, you know. Okay. We believe in it, you know, and why we use it, and we believe that this is what is from mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. You believe that this, uh, this food is from Jesus Christ? Well, let's talk about these verses. This parable here, he talks about... He, he talks about... Um, where does the parable start? It says, prove yourselves ready because the Son of Man is coming. And then he asks, who is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed, o- who his master appointed over him, uh, uh, appointed over his domestics to give them food in proper time? Happy is that slave if his master on coming finds him doing so. And then later, if ever that slave says, my master's delaying, and he starts to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with the confirmed drunkards, and he will punish him. So he's... I know that, the, that you believe that this is prophesying there will be a faithful and discreet slave who is appointed. Mm-hmm. I guess my question would be, do you understand it that way because the watchtower told you so? Or because you examined the verses in the context and came to that conclusion. I feel that's oversimplifying it yeah. because, uh, you know, all, actually everybody here, the three of us have decades, we've been in the organization, we've been learning this for years, there's no holes, but we haven't seen holes in it, and what would you do there's, if you also the, there's also the physical evidence with our eyes, like I said about the organization, what it's, what it's uh, been able to accomplish with it from nothing, you know, starting from nothing hundred or so years ago. You say there's um, that, that's not what's at issue, my friend. My friend. My question, though, is what would you do if you saw a hole? You believe there are no holes. I get that. What would you do if you saw a hole? Would it matter? I would just. I would probably look into it, and it doesn't matter because that's we're talking to you about it. That's what I'm saying. Is that to you? It doesn't seem to matter. It wouldn't shake my faith. I, I should be more specific here. Your right. faith in what? My faith, in, first of all, in the Bible, and then in the fact that who God is using. You know they. It doesn't, I don't worry that they make a minor mistake they have. I don't worry about that. Mm-hmm. Because it's not the little things, those little uh, details that, run, uh, that uh, motivate our faith. What, the, what does motivate your faith, though? It's the bigger picture. It's seeing what, well, we've already told you, what the organization accomplished, how it, how it goes in line with the, with the thrust of the Bible. You know, not every detail is not going to be right. We can't know everything. Nobody does. You will never know. Phil, you're going to study as much as you want. You will never know. I plan to. No, and <laughs> good for you. You already have. And I intend to enjoy and it. And nobody will ever 
including you, will ever know all the details in the near future. We You're know. absolutely right. But you see, if there's some little thing wrong, it doesn't shake our faith. We don't, oh, well, I'm not going to trust this organization because they were wrong about that thing. I'm seeing what they're accomplishing on a physical level, on a, with our eyes. It's not just teachings. It all comes together, so it's not just, you know. When I, when I say if there are holes, I'm not talking about if we're wrong about how tall Goliath was. I know, I know. I'm talking about if there are holes in the big picture. Would that matter? Would that make a difference? To me, it has to make a difference. It would, but there's no major holes, my friend. And there, if there were, what would that do? How would you approach it? it it's, a, it's too hypothetical. Mm -hmm. It's a hypothetical. Like, to consider, like this verse, for example, doesn't it seem awfully convenient that the watchtower teaches that this talks about the watchtower? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that seem awfully convenient? I'm not saying that makes it wrong, but it does seem convenient. Doesn't every religion claim they're right? They absolutely like do. You're, you're saying, you're actually blaming the watchtower for saying they're, they're, that this fits and that they're right. Everybody says that. But I'm saying that they're using this verse to support their authority. And that's up to them. But it's like, circular. They're using circular reasoning to apply this verse to themselves. Anyhow, and shouldn't we? Because the Bible is our primary basis for yeah. teaching. Yeah, and this teach it, you know, you see they do that because Jesus told that who will be truly his disciple who have to be Allow between these uh, disciples have to be allowed uh, around all world, you know, or there. Uh, but uh, you know, it's just in between mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses because or religion. Mm -hmm. But do you understand how this is a circular argument that but what the, this sense? this verse refers to the Watchtower because the Watchtower says this verse refers to the Watchtower and the Watchtower is right because they are the faithful and discreet slave referred to that in that verse, which brings us back to point one. It's a circular reasoning. I mean, if we found our authority in a verse in the Quran and that said that we're, the governing body is inspired by God, that wouldn't make mm -hmm. much sense. Would it, I mean, why would we bring another... For example, why do you, why you put this I, I, I just want to finish what, I, what I'm saying about circular reasoning. I'm saying that if, you know, if the Bible says something specific, you begin by assuming that the Bible is correct, the Bible says this, therefore that's correct. That's a valid argument. If you say... This means that, and we know that because this means that, and we know that because this means that, you haven't actually proven anything. It's exactly the same as whenever um, Christians in general will, will kind of make an argument of the, of the style that the Bible says that the Bible is the word of God, the, God doesn't lie, and we know that what it says in the Bible is true because it's the word of God. It just, it just, com it just comes back around on itself. You can do exactly the same thing with the Quran. The Quran says there's the word of God. You can say that the word of God doesn't lie, and we know that that's the word of God because the Quran says there's the word of God. You understand that's not a, that's not a proof of any kind. It's circular reasoning. It doesn't bring you anywhere. It, it has no basis. It's begging the question. It begins by assuming what it sets out to, pro sets out to prove. So what I'm saying is that we should be free. We should be free to understand what this means, without, you know, an authority figure telling us that this means to obey that authority figure. Philip, you know, uh, maybe we stay here to you. But yeah, can you leave for us? Maybe for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe yeah. there and then uh, we just have to decide something. Just for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. It's possible. Yeah. You know, I can you leave my coat here. I think everybody just Okay. Can you open First Corinthians chapter 5 mm -hmm. and verse 11, 13, to verse, it's in this verse is our decision, you know. Mm -hmm. Can you read? Which, ver which verses? 11 and 13. But now I am writing to you to stop keeping company with anyone called a brother who is sexually immoral or a greedy person 
or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, nor even eating with such a man. Verse 13, while God judges those outside, oh, that ends the other sentence. Yeah. Verse 13 says, remove the wicked person from among yourselves. Yeah. And you know how it is that you are the liberal. Yeah. And the reason, um, did you understand what he said? The fellowship, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We want to make sure you understand the reason why. Let's go straight to First Timothy uh, still. Mm-hmm. Well, among other, First Timothy six kind of put this succinctly, mm-hmm. really concise. Just a few words, verse words. Into verse three itself, if any man teaches another doctrine, this is not a the wholesome instruction. So we found that. Um, it goes on to describe that kind of man and mm-hmm. some negative things that we don't have to just go into it, but that's what we have found mm-hmm. uh, in in view of the charge of apostasy that yeah that we don't have any doubt that you're teaching another doctrine uh, or and do not do not agree with this and we have no doubt about that and so that's why First Corinthians five applies here. Okay. However. Yeah, uh, we'd also like to look at Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations? Did not see that coming. <laughs> this is a beautiful scripture. <laughs> Lamenta- right. Lamentations always comes out of left field. Lamentations 3? <laughs> yeah. um, verses 40 and 41. It says, Let us examine and scrutinize our ways, and let us return to Jehovah. Let us lift up our hearts along with our hands to God in the heavens. Mm-hmm. So we've made the decision to fellowship you from the congregation. Mm-hmm. But that does not mean that you cannot have a relationship with Jehovah. We want you to return to Jehovah. And we're reminded in this verse that we can do that in verse 41 by praying to Jehovah. Verse 40, though, it says examine and scrutinize our ways. Mm-hmm. So we, we want you to do that. We want you to think about your relationship with Jehovah to think about where your course is heading and how you can draw close to Jehovah by returning to the congregation. Mm-hmm. That's what we want you to, to do in harmony with this advice. Mm-hmm. So the, the only thing left uh, for this meeting is we want you to know that um, you have a right of appeal. Mm-hmm. Um, you have seven days. It's your right to choose. We're not encouraging or discouraging it. Mm-hmm. But you can choose to say, put into writing why you feel um, our decision was wrong, mm-hmm. and then a, that could prompt an appeal committee made up of three other brothers mm-hmm. to hear the evidence again or hear hear the case again. I shouldn't say mm-hmm. the case. That have, that would have been coming up a lot. Yes, yes. Um, that, that's it. Right. So my question about that is, like I understand, it's you. Uh, the the appeal requires a written request. To whom is that re- written request made? To this committee. Yeah. So, so I would give it to you, basically. Give it to us, but we uh, we would be compelled to. We can't. We won't. We wouldn't anyway. I, I I understand that. I just wanted to know what was, what the will, process was to whom to whom that request is to be sent. So we would get it, and then. Um, I know you're honest people. Don't don't get me wrong. <laughs> I was just asking. <laughs> no, no, no. And you know what? It's a good question. So, but it would be addressed. It mm-hmm. would definitely be addressed, and three. They would form an, what we call an appeal committee. You probably know what that is, mm-hmm. just by its very words. Mm-hmm. You know. And they, they would hear it. You, you could say, um, you could just say why you think it, we made a mistake. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's all. Yeah. So that's up to you. Or you can let it go and then just, or, and apply uh, lamentations there to, to scrutinize your ways, return to Job, and it's up to you. Mm-hmm. We, we leave the ball in, in your court, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. So, I just, like, for what it's worth, I'm, I don't know if you had already considered this, but just to point out, the verse you read in Corinthians doesn't say anything about apostasy in the verse that you read in Timothy. I don't think it said anything about disfellowship. I just thought it an interesting juxtaposition of verses. Well, the, the, uh, you understand, like, we, we can debate it if you wish. Um, mm-hmm. The thing is, the verse in First Corinthians, it doesn't include every single serious sin there. It doesn't, because you can tell by the, the, the offenses there mm-hmm. that include that basically anything of a serious nature is uh, a serious mm-hmm. sin, and it's well known that apostasy in yeah. those organizations is considered it's, such. I mean, it's an interesting interpolation. I, under, I see what you're saying, but mm-hmm. just 
just not every offense is concluded there. Mm -hmm. You know, we get the idea, yeah. so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that brings us to the okay. Yeah, these things I had brought were just different things that I thought might come up um, in regards to the disfellowship arrangement and judicial committees. But I guess we didn't. Maybe we'll get around to it for the uh, the appeal committee. Maybe. Perhaps, as you wish. Um, how does that? I like. I, I was aware that an appeal committee was a thing, but is it me and three other brothers, or me and three brothers and you guys? So what'll happen? I've been on both. I've been on. Yeah. Oh, you have been. I've been where. I've seen it done, okay? Okay. Let me put it that way. So what happens, how it proceeds, is three new uh, committees form, appeal committee, mm -hmm. and the original committee, us, will attend, mm -hmm. basically to ensure that the person tells, like what they're saying is what we actually heard. To make sure that I'm not misrepresenting what you're saying. Exactly. Okay. Or even what, because, you know, you could okay. say something else. Mm -hmm. it's like, I didn't say that. And oh, like, yeah, that's Yes, too. he did. <laughs> so we're not there. We, we, we cannot influence the, the committee. Okay, so you're there like in a semi-observer yes. kind of role just to kind of fact-check things that I might say about this meeting. In fact, in fact, what happens is when, it, it, when they want to deliberate, mm -hmm. the four of us will leave the room. Mm -hmm. Like, we, don't, we have nothing to do with that. Yeah. So it's entirely up to them. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's good. I was just curious. No, it's a good question. You're yeah. welcome to ask that. Oh, yeah. this is your Bible, and uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Bye, so well, maybe we'll see you again. Yep. I hope so. Sure. So, have a seat. Yeah. a lot about the, the conversation that we had the last weekend, and I'm getting the feeling that I was a bit, I was wrong about what the, what the meeting was even for, really, because I thought we were there to determine whether or not I had been spreading any false teachings, right, because that's what um, apostasy is, at least that's my understanding, that it's the spreading of false teachings. But, um, well, first of all, the they told me they had already decided before I even showed up that, you know, they weren't going to discuss whether or not I had spared any false teachings. All they were there to, they had already decided and they were just there to see whether or not I would take back the things that they heard that I'd said. And it's, I got the distinct impression, it was like, um, it was like they didn't even, like you all don't even seem to care whether what you believe is true or false. You know what I mean? Because to me it's very important to know whether what I believe is true or false. It's very important to me. But all that seemed to be important in this meeting was whether or not I believe that the governing body is gu guided by God's Holy Spirit. It had nothing to do with whether there was any factual basis for that or any reasoning behind it. It all had to do with whether or not I'm going to believe what I'm told to believe. Because the thing is, the governing body and the, the watchtower, they tell us, you know, what to believe. If you don't believe that things are told to believe, you're being disobedient. They tell you what to do, how to feel about it. They tell you what you need to know, what you don't need to know. And those things all together um, actually make for a kind of a, a certain kind of psychological manipulation that borders on abuse. It's... Um, in the literature, it's called the BITE model. It stands for control over behavior, um, information, thoughts, and emotions. 
And so that's the reason, really, why I decided to stop attending meetings is because I wanted to get away from that kind of highly controlling environment. And so now, you know, I come to a meeting like this where I'm being told basically, go back to believing what we tell you or else we're going to try to cut off all of your friends and family, which, again, is something that an abusive organization would do. So I was given no sound scriptural basis for any of it. It was just, this is what the governing body tells us, this is what we have to do, and that's, that was the end of it. May I ask, um, did, they, did they not share scriptures with you that evening? They shared scriptures, but they were not really interested in discussing them. Okay, in what sense discussing them? Like, what would you like them to do with those scriptures? Well, like, they would read a scripture, and then I would have some questions about the scripture, and they would say things like, oh, well, we can debate that all, you know, all night. We're never going to get an answer. Like, they would just kind of shy away from those, from those discussions. Okay. Like, one of the key um, scriptures that comes up in discussions about um, apostasy and shunning and things like that is that scripture in, um, is it in the second John? Uh, where it's talking about um, the Antichrist, right? If someone comes to you um, not bringing this teaching that is of Christ having come in the flesh, that you are not to receive him into your homes, and um, it says not to say greeting to him. So I want to discuss the, the background of that scripture further, but the committee was not really interested in pursuing that discussion. It was like the matter had already been settled. It's not worth discussing. Now, as, as we understand it, though, that evening was not the first discussion that they had had with your the beliefs that you were questioning and the, as you mentioned, the psychological manipulation you feel the governing body uh, engaged in. As we understand it, there had been previous discussions previous to that evening. Is that correct? Or um, previous discussions with, like one or two elders prior to, with some of the members of the committee, yeah, mm -hmm. months ago. So there have been discussions where there was a forum for that, for you to air your issues with those, uh, as you say, those, those ideologies. I, I don't recall those points having been discussed, okay. but I, I could be wrong. That was several months ago. Okay, so in those previous meetings, what were discussed? Um, or what was the purpose for them, I may ask? Well, the previous meetings with the members of the Judicial Committee were simply them coming to my door um, unannounced and just basically asking me, again, trying to um, persuade me to come back to the meetings. I don't remember the, the details because, like I said, it was several months ago. I wasn't taking notes, <laughs> especially when I was busy making breakfast. All right. So the the reason you appealed the decision for you to be disfellowshipped is well, because I didn't, um, I didn't feel there was any sound scriptural basis for disfellowshipping in this case. Like I said, um, my understanding is that apostasy means spreading false teachings. I haven't gone about spreading any teachings at all. Um, what I'm most interested in is questioning, questioning everything that. Um, that we have, like, things that we have a tendency to assume but just kind of take for granted. To me, the only way to, you know, know whether what I believe is true or not is by examining my beliefs, comparing them with the evidence, and not taking anything for granted because that's how, that's how we make uh, mistakes, right? People all over the world take for granted the things that they were raised believing, and obviously all those beliefs tend to contradict each other, so they're people just raised with false beliefs that they just never question. So that's, to me, if I want to make sure that I'm right about something, it's essential that I question it. Do you, you question the faith on the streets life? Shouldn't I? I'm just asking. Well, we want to know what, mm -hmm. what you... I, I choose to question everything that... I believe in everything that I've been taught, as much as I can, right? Um, the human mind is such that 
we often don't realize the things that we're not questioning. So I'm sure there's lots of ideas that I have that I haven't gotten around to questioning and that I haven't realized that I haven't gotten around to questioning. But when I realize that I... I was that I have a, or have or had a belief such as believing that the governing body is appointed by Jehovah to serve spiritual food. To me, that's the sort of thing. And given how much of a uh, control this idea has over our lives, then then that's one of the most important things to question in my mind. Did you question that at the time you were baptized? I don't think I did, at least not not very seriously. And if I did question it, the um, the fear of the the consequences that would come with that. Because when you question something, right, there's obviously two possible outcomes: either you're right or you're wrong. And knowing the consequences of coming to the conclusion that I was wrong creates a very very powerful motivating motivating force to stick with what you were taught, right? And so, I mean, the, the idea might have come into my head from time to time, probably, to, to question these teachings, but I never really, um, I don't think I ever questioned them really seriously. So, um, yeah, you, you, you're saying that you, you believe in questioning everything, mm-hmm. and, you know, I can respect that, because um, we, don't, we don't want people to be gullible. People should right. be gullible at anything. No, I totally agree. That's true. Um, so have you at any point in your life taken the time to investigate, look into this? Uh, have you found what you're looking for? Is have I looking found... For truth? Have you found those answers that you're looking for? Is there some other place where you found them? Well, I would say that I found what I'm looking for in a sense, in the sense that what I'm looking for is how to approach life in such a way that I can, you know, believe as many true things as possible and as few false things as possible. And uh, skepticism and the scientific method of comparing um, any claims that anyone makes with the evidence mm-hmm. and going wherever the evidence leads us is, is what I've been doing, and it's been working out very well for me. So based on that, but we have to ask them, is it your, is it your desire, because we're in an appeal committee here tonight, mm-hmm. is it your desire to be a member of the congregation, to have a relationship with Jehovah, to be one of his witnesses? It's my desire to be allowed to speak to my family. Okay, but is it your desire to be a member of the congregation? That depends what that means to you. Well, it means to be an active member of the congregation in step with the direction that we get from the scriptures. Does that mean believing what I'm told to believe? No, it means believing what... Well, I'm not going to get into a debate with you, but what we're asking is, you know, as Jehovah's Witnesses, we endeavor to follow what the Scriptures say. Um, we all took a, took, a, took a point in our lives where we looked into the Scriptures to, to see if it was in line with what we were being told, and that's what our basis for dedication is. So is that your desire to be a part of that, is what I'm asking. And I'm saying that that's contingent on my having the freedom to openly question, especially the most important things, the questions like, is the governing body um, appointed by and guided by God's Holy Spirit, and even the question of, is the Bible the inerrant and infallible Word of God? Because from those two premises, premises, Premises? (laughs) from those two assumptions (laughs) or beliefs, it seems to me that all Jehovah's Witnesses' beliefs and practices logically follow from those two beginnings, from the belief that the Bible is the inerrant and infallible Word of God and the belief that you can't really understand the Bible without the spiritual guidance that the Watchtower has apparently exclusive access to. So I guess what I'm trying to ask in a roundabout way then is, is, is if you don't agree with that and the, all eight million Jehovah's Witnesses feel that way, why do you want to be a part of that congregation um, if you don't feel the Bible is the Word of God. Like, our, our life is, revolves around our belief, our confidence that the Bible is the Word of God. And you don't believe that, you don't agree mm-hmm. with that. So why do you want to be a part, continue to be a part of this organization in any capacity? 
because it's my firm belief, and I think the, the scriptures agree with me on this, that my parents and my friends should be allowed to speak to me even if I don't believe the same things that they do. So, for instance, if I could disassociate without having my friends and family torn away by your decision, by a decision of, you know, three men in a committee, if I could, if I were free to make that choice without those really draconian consequences, then that would be a reasonable course of action. But here I am in a situation where I was raised in an organization that punishes um, anyone who leaves with the strictest punishment available to them, which is barely legal, but as long as you word the announcement just right, then no one can sue you for it. Like, I came into this meeting, I don't know if I mentioned this already, uh, when, I, when I came here um, Saturday, I, I had all these questions ready because I wanted to, to see how, how the elders would explain things like um, what scriptural precedent is there for holding secret trials or what's the scriptural precedent for... Um, secret trials. Well, like this, a judicial committee is a, a trial, right? Okay. After a fashion. It's held in secret, right? I'm not allowed to have any, anyone here to, um, to back me up or even to, to witness the proceedings. It's all done in a very secret secretive fashion. Um, I'm not aware of there being any biblical precedent for any such uh, proceeding. In fact, in the, uh, in the times of, of Israel, it's described that the judges were to judge at the gate of the city in the most open forum possible, specifically so that the, whatever the judge does as part of the proceedings is open to scrutiny to the general public. Whereas in this judicial committee arrangement, you have the exact opposite. There's no scrutiny whatsoever, except for appeal committees, which, by the way, I've never actually heard of an appeal committee overturning a decision. I don't know if you guys have. I think it's pretty clear where you stand <laughs> um, when it comes to our, our beliefs as a congregation. Mm -hmm. I think that's really clear. Do you believe in God at this point in your life? Or are you asking because you... I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at, at the end of the day, Phil, you're asking, what you're asking is, you're saying you want to remain one of Jehovah's Witnesses, even if only on paper. Um, we all here, including yourself, went over the questions for baptism. We all here went over the questions where we became unbaptized publishers. These are all things that we said, well, yeah, I've done my research. Mm -hmm. Based on my research, this is the decision I want to make. And so to you, if somebody chooses to leave the, the religion they were raised in, they deserve to be shunned by all their friends and family. This is a reasonable thing to you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Just, uh, I'm sure you'd agree with this you know, fundamental truth. Uh, in Proverbs 13 and 20, it says, the one walking with the wise will become wise, right? So I'm sure you'd agree. Common sense. It's, co it's common sense, right? So uh, a question that you may want to ask yourself is even if you were to remain one of Jehovah's Witnesses, but um, you were to continue to share the ideas that you have with your friends and family. If they ask. If, if they were to ask, right? Um, how do you think that may affect their desire to have a relationship with you? That should be entirely up to them. Uh, I, I agree. But just as in terms of like a thought exercise, how, how do you think they would respond to some of the things you're saying? Do you think that it would make them want to become closer to you? Or do you think those thoughts and ideas that you're, you're sharing, the questions that you're raising, um, might make them feel a little bit distant from you? Well, I can tell you from experience how, how people would, would react to that because... Um, I've stopped attending meetings back in late March 2015. So from March until up until right now, I've been, you know, not disfellowshipped. And I've also haven't hidden from, haven't gone out of my way to hide from anyone um, the, 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 the questions that have, that have been on my mind and the decisions that I've made in regards to that in terms of not going to meetings. So 
I can tell you from experience how Jehovah's Witnesses react in those situations. The vast majority of them will become very uncomfortable and will stop talking to me. Um, some, I've heard some people call it preemptive shunning, if you will. Um, there's a small number of people who will, you know, want to maintain a friendship regardless, um, even though they worry that I might, you know, become disfellowshipped and then they suddenly won't be allowed to anymore. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, they're, they're, they're a minority, but there is a number of, of Jehovah's Witnesses, whom I know personally, who are okay with having some friendly um, association even though we have different beliefs. And would your parents be included in that small group? It's very important to me that my parents still be allowed to speak to me. Yeah. I would rather resent anyone trying to prevent that. So what I'm kind of, the reason I'm asking these questions is because um, whether or not you're disfellowshipped, uh, whether or not a person is, is a Jehovah's Witness or not, we choose our friends based on, you know, sharing the same core values, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're rejecting the core values of your family, your friends, regardless of whether or not you're disfellowshipped, the relationships are going to be affected. So the, the issue here is not as much, you know, whether or not you're disfellowship. The issue is, is, is what you believe. You know? If that's the case, then what's the disfellowshipping for? Um, the disfellowshipping has more to do with your sharing these beliefs. So you're, if I hear you right, you're agreeing with me that everyone should have the right to choose whether or not they want to speak to me or not. And yet, okay, I misheard that part. Scriptures guide us on how we should treat ones that are disfellowshipped, right? It's up to each individual whether or not they want to apply the scriptures, but the scriptures are very clear on you know how we should treat ones that teach something different mm-hmm. from uh, what the Bible teaches. Okay, because I looked at those scriptures and they didn't seem clear on that at all. So what? Because so if I understand it, you you progressed to the point in, when you were. Uh, in the truth, you progressed to the point of becoming a ministerial servant. I was. Um, so was that all a farce? Was that all an act? Like, what was what what was it that convinced you spiritually to get to that point in your worship where you could be taking a form of a lead in the congregation as a servant? If you're saying that you've never seen any of these scriptures, what did you see that moved you to get that far into Jehovah's organization? Well, at the time, I believed that by, that by studying the Bible and helping others to learn about the Bible, I believed at the time that that was helping to carry out God's will, that I was doing something important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned as well <clears throat> that you haven't set out to, to share your teachings with anyone, but you, you did, to be fair, you did just mention that you did with some of your friends and that they got uncomfortable. When people asked, I answered honestly. Okay. Have you posted things online about your feelings? I post things about my feelings all the time. About the feelings about, about your feelings about Jehovah's Witnesses, not about a meal or. I may have. <laughs> I can get pretty strong feelings about my food. Um, <laughs> I I may have shared things regarding how I feel about f- the freedom to um, believe or or worship as as one as, as one's conscience dictates without being forced to choose between your beliefs and your family. I may have posted something along those lines. Okay. Um, because, you, you know, right here, you're in a room full of Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. And our basis for being in the truth is not uh, simple credulity. Someone told us to do this, and we said, okay. It wasn't that simple. It was testing out what the Bible tells us to do, seeing the benefits of it, and continuing on that course. It's mm-hmm. as simple as that. Uh, your parents are in the same situation. That's why your parents are in the truth today. That's mm-hmm. why they are Jehovah's Witnesses. So when they see the benefits of all of those things, and they hear someone saying that they disagree with those courses, that they feel 
there should be a contrary or a different course. It is as, and I'm not trying to insult you, but it is as offensive to them as someone saying to me, I should date another woman other than my wife. When I found what I'm looking for here, I should be going here. So as a congregation, I'm just going to be blunt with you because we're all adults here. When individuals start espousing those views, and it doesn't have to be in an official form, as a congregation, to protect the spirituality of the congregation, that individual is not allowed to remain part of the congregation. It is as simple as that. But what exactly are you protecting the congregation from, if not questions that you can't answer? Well, you've read the scriptures on apostasy in the Bible. You may not agree with them. I didn't say I don't agree with them. I don't agree with what you think they mean. Fair enough. But as Jehovah's Witnesses, we look at the direction when it comes to, like you said, things in 2 John that you've read. We look at that direction and we take it very seriously to protect our own spirituality and the spirituality of our brothers and sisters. And to be honest, we can't apologize for that. No more than, like I said, no more than someone can apologize for saying, I love my wife more than any other girl in the world. We can't apologize for that. We can't be apologetic. And we can't shy away from strictly observing what the scriptures tell us to do in these situations. And it's literally as simple as that. Can you show me the scripture that says that if someone voluntarily changes their beliefs, that their friends and family should avoid speaking to them altogether? Okay, well, we're not going to get into, I'll be honest with you, we're not here to debate the scriptures. We're not here to debate the scriptures. No, we're not. Because it's not, it gets you nowhere. There's no debate. How does that work? How does that get you nowhere? I have a hard time wrapping my head around that idea. So, what, sorry. If you're, you're talking about your family, so your father and I don't know, your mom and maybe someone else. But if they choose to not associate with you, talk with you, that's their decision. What if their decision depends on your decision? What about that? Doesn't it? But what's your point? Well, you're saying it's their decision, but you're about to tell them what their decision is. No, we don't tell them what to do. You don't? No, it's their decision. When you stand on the platform and say, Philip Volks is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you're not telling people not to speak to me. They serve Jehovah, and they recognize. So your parents, from what I understand, they're witnesses, so they recognize the channel Jehovah uses to understand his word and direction. So here, we're in a field committee to consider why you object to the decision to disfellowship you. We are looking at you. So if the decision is to disfellowship you, we're not telling your parents what to do. Do you honestly believe that? I think the reason why this is a challenge, and I can understand if I was in your shoes, I'd have a hard time with it too, right? Right. If you're not sure that... I mean, if you'd been raised Catholic, let's say, and you left, and then there was an announcement made that said, okay, no one here is allowed to talk to this person because he decided not to be a Catholic anymore, right? You'd have a problem with that. If I didn't believe in God, if I wasn't sure there was a God, and I didn't believe in the Bible, then certainly I wouldn't accept Bible teachings. And that's, from what it sounds like, the position that you're in. You're not sure if there's a creator. You're not sure the Bible is the 100% inspired word of God. So any explaining of the Bible's teachings to you, it's almost like trying to have a discussion about grammar in a foreign language. There's no context for it, right? But if we were to just ask you simply, do you want to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses, what would you say? I believe I've answered that already, that I would not be part of an organization that restricts my ability to use my powers of reason, and I firmly believe that my friends and family should be permitted to speak to me. Okay, so those are two separate issues, right? One issue is whether or not you want to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. A separate issue is the consequences of that. What I want is to be allowed to speak to my friends and family. Can you see how there are two different issues? You can want both things, right? Are you suggesting I shouldn't be allowed to speak to my friends and family if I don't want to 
surrender my powers of reason to the Watchtower? I'm just laying out the facts for you, right? Um, like in Canada, for example, you can only be married to, to one woman. This is a law in Canada, yes. Right. So, do you want to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses? Again, I feel I've answered that question already. And just, would you be able to say just like yes or no? Or? What I want is, I think an entirely reasonable thing to want, is to be allowed to speak to my friends and family. Okay, I, I, I understand why this is so, so difficult and why it's difficult. Because, to... because I get the feeling that you're trying to get me to agree to something that's impossible to agree to. Like, just based on your discernment, like, where, do you think you're going to be able to have what you want? What do you mean by that? Well, you said that, you know, you want the Jehovah's organ or the organization that we belong to, you know, is borderline abusive. Right? Mm -hmm. You've made it clear that you, you don't want to be a part of it, but at the same time, you don't want the consequence of having, of being disfellowshipped. Do you think that you'll be able to have both of those things? Because it sounds to me like you're asking me to either by answering yes, surrender my powers of reason and believe whatever I'm told to believe, no. or by answering no, accept the rather indefensible punishment of shunning, including um, by immediate family members. So, so the Bible says, prove to yourself, right, what's the good and acceptable will of God. So we're not mm -hmm. promoting blind faith or, or credulity in any way, mm -hmm. right? But we've, we've come to a point where you you have to decide whether or not you want to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And you choice those two alternatives that I just um, described. Namely, on the one hand, accepting being cut off from my friends and family, or on the other hand, accepting to simply believe whatever I'm told to believe. You know, it's interesting you should say that about being cut off and things like that, because there are many Jehovah's Witnesses all over the world mm -hmm who were cut off from their family when they became Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and that was immoral. Now, that's your, that's your feeling, and, and that's your, you can feel that way if you wish. Mm -hmm. That's also... Uh, but they, but they, did, they did accept that because of their value, the value they had in their relationship with Jehovah, they were willing to accept that. They didn't want it, but they were willing to accept it. And the reason they were willing to accept it is because they did what you said we should do. Is they looked into the scriptures and they said, this is the truth, this is my future, this is the future I want, and I'm not going to let anything get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. And your parents are no different than that. They are going to protect their relationship with Jehovah. Uh, regardless of what their son chooses to do, they're going to protect their relationship with Jehovah. And they can't apologize for that. We can't apologize for that. Um, we have seen firsthand... The, the benefits of following Jehovah's laws in our life, but we can't say sorry to anyone who doesn't agree with that. However, if that's the case, you are free to go and live your life, but it, it, it's, there's no scriptural basis for you having those ideas and remaining a member of the congregation. Um, you've read the scriptures, and I know you don't agree with them, but we are following scriptural direction. First Corinthians 5, we're following the scriptural direction there, and in Second John. See, you say you're following the scriptural direction, but you're not willing to discuss whether those directions are actually consistent with the scriptures. Well, here's the thing. Um, the reality because, is... Because these, are not, these directions are from the Shepherd of the Flock of God book, among other things. Right? They're from the Bible is where they're from. Is you, they, clearly, you clearly have looked in the Shepherd of the Flock of God book. I've read it. And based on your looking at it, you can clearly see that all the references in the Shepherd of the Flock of God book are things that are in literature that was placed in the, min in the ministry. There's no secret book in there. All the references are from the Watchtower and the Awake. It's not a secret. Exactly. The references are so the basis so, so for So if that, I took a Shepherd of the Flock of God book and went and, and gave it to, to a random sister in the it's hall... It's your business. It's your business. I'll tell you this. The sister so will refuse it. But that's your business. Because it's not but a secret. At, but at the end of the day... She's not allowed to see it because it's not a secret. At the end of the day, you look through the book, and you can see that every reference in there is in the material that's on these shelves, in the material that we go out on weekends and during the week, and we share with the public. 
So you can feel how you want to feel. That's your decision. But our brothers and sisters, and we're not apologetic for it, and we're not sorry for it, our brothers and sisters want to worship Jehovah. They want to worship Jehovah uh, uninterrupted. Uh, they don't want anything getting in the way of their worship of Jehovah based on the benefits of that. So if someone wants to teach things contrary or wants to espouse things contrary to that, uh, whether you're disfellowshipped or not, Phil, I'm, I hate to break it to you, but uh, those relationships, as Chris mentioned, those relationships are going to be sullied anyway. Your, your parents, even if you weren't disfellowshipped tonight, your parents would, I'm telling you right now, your parents are probably going to hold off association with you anyway for the protection of their own spirituality. You don't agree with that, and we respect that. It's a free country. It's a free planet. Mm -hmm. Even with Cain in the Bible, Cain had thoughts that Jehovah didn't agree with, and he said, well, you're going on the wrong path, but Jehovah didn't stop him. But at the same time, he didn't accept Cain as part of his fold. Cain went off on his own. Jehovah said, I'm not going to espouse this. So we, we can't apologize for that as a congregation. But it sounds like you're conveniently detached from the consequences of the decisions you make here. No, we're asking you to think about the consequences of the decision. And the reality is when you went over the questions for baptism and you became an unbaptized publisher, all of those things were discussed way back then. We've had people, for instance, who who said, uh, we, I want to get baptized. Mm -hmm. And we've just sat down with them and looked in the scriptures with them and we've told them, you know what, you're not ready for baptism. Mm -hmm. yeah, look, there, there's things you need to learn. So if, if, if it was just simply about keeping people in the organization and having a membership drive, if you will, we would just like let anyone walk in off the street and we'd add to our numbers, but it's just simply not that simple. There are Bible standards that we as Jehovah's Witnesses abide by, and if you don't want to abide by them, that's your decision. That's your decision. But it's not something that is accepted in the congregation. But I'm talking about the consequences of the decision that you're about to make, right? You're about to make a decision about whether or not my parents are allowed to speak to me. Do you understand that? Our decision will be about your choices, what you have chosen to do. That's what our decision is based on. But you don't recognize that your decision is going to effectively be an order to all Jehovah's Witnesses, including my parents, about whether or not they're allowed to speak to me. We don't take this lightly. I should hope not. But the ball is in your court. And do you think it's reasonable to offer me those two alternatives, to either believe what I'm told to believe, or accept being cut off from friends and family. Does that seem like a reasonable choice to you? Does that seem to you like something that the scriptures explicitly require? We respect the faithful slave's direction on understanding God's word. We, we love Jehovah. We love Christ as the head of the congregation. And we recognize the faithful slave's governing body helping us to understand what Jehovah wants us to do. We wish that you would see it the way you did before but we reap what we sow. If this is what you want to sow, then just like us, we have to reap what we sow. So it's your decision. And if I may, um, there have been some people, uh, like the man in the first century Christian congregation, mm -hmm. um, who were, was disfellowshipped, and that time when he was in the disfellowship state that benefited him, he later returned to the congregation, and we've seen we've seen it happen where people who didn't agree that they should be disfellowshipped, but the situation caused them to dig even deeper into their hearts and into their motives for doing the things that they were doing and thinking the things that uh, they were thinking, and it resulted in them coming to a place spiritually that they never imagined possible at the time of the disfellowshipping. And it's impossible for you to know how this decision will affect you. Right? But we're very hopeful that it will affect, that this process is going to have a positive effect on you. And no matter how smart you are, you can't say you know how it will affect you. you oh, know? I totally agree with that. Right? Intelligence is much less important in some areas than people realize. 
the, the scriptures say we don't know what our life will be to be tomorrow. So mm -hmm. you don't know if this might be exactly what you need uh, so that you can get to where you want to be spiritually in your relationship with Jehovah and even with your family. Mm -hmm. In the example that you mentioned, of uh, I believe that was in First and Second Corinthians, the man uh, who was in some sort of incestuous relationship. Mm -hmm. um, if I recall correctly, the direction was to treat him as a as a man of the nations, as a non-Christian, right? That's all I want to be treated as a non-Jehovah's Witness. We, we sympathize with uh, what you would like. Um, Can you give me any scriptural reason why I can't have that? Have what? Be simply treated as a non-Jehovah's Witness, but being free to speak to whomever I, whomever I wants to have um, friendship with me of some kind. Mm -hmm. well. Because there's several billion non-Jehovah's Witnesses in the world whom you are free to speak to whenever you like. There's just a specific undisclosed number of ex-Jehovah's Witnesses whom you're not allowed to speak to. The Bible says, if I um, believe it's in Matthew, when, when Jesus talks about how to treat someone who has um, committed a sin uh, against you or something, and he says to, to go to that person, then to go to the, to the congregation. And then... If all else fails, he is to be treated like a man of the nations as a tax collector, basically as a non-member, not as someone who must be avoided at all costs. Okay, That's so all I'm asking for. So, because I'll, I'll be frank with you, uh, Phil, Second John 10, and that Second John 10 is very blunt. It says, "Do not say a greeting to him." So you disagree with that one, but then you're agreeing with. The context is yeah, very important in that one. But you see, that's, that's the point. It's, it's, either, it's either all or nothing with the scriptures. It, it, we, we can't take, a, an old friend of mine used to call it, we can't take Bible a la carte, where we pick verses and go, I, I like this one, I'm going to pass on that one. It's either we either take it all or we take nothing, right? Um, so you, 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 if you want to use one scripture as a basis, you've got to look at Second John 10. And again, the Bible's advice, the Bible's direction is very clear to us. As Jehovah's Witnesses, that is our source for conduct, for behavior, for decision making, big and small, is Bible principles. And, 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 and sometimes we open up our Bible to look, and sometimes we just think of Bible principles, but that's our, that's our, our, our basis for everything. That's never going to change. And 2 John 10 is very, very clear, and it's for our own protection that the scriptures say do not receive them into your home, or say a greeting to them. It's no mystery what many individuals who have left Jehovah's Organization say about Jehovah's Witnesses today. It's no mystery. They say some horrible things about us. Mm -hmm. um, they say some, some very fanciful stories about us. Now, I don't want to hear them. None of Jehovah's Witnesses want to hear them. We simply want to worship Jehovah. So if we want to believe those things and teach those things, you're welcome to do so. But it the, the second John 10 is very clear. It's, it's not going to happen within Jehovah's organization. I'll be blunt with you. My mother's an apostate. Mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I do not listen to her teachings. I do not listen to the things she says. Mm -hmm. okay? I look at her life, I look at my life, and, I'm, and I, I'm very happy with the life I have as a result of just...